Hello, hello, everybody. It's 5.27 p.m. Central Time on the 9th of October, 2022. It's Sunday here in the United States. Monday already internationally. Check it out. It's autumn. It's fall. It's beautiful outside, but slightly brisk. We're not here to talk about that, of course. We are here to talk about seismic events that have happened in the past few days since my last update. And now here it is. We have now taken the next step up. You can see on the screen here right in front of your face, 6.2 rolling by here on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And let me actually get a display capture open so you can see just a little bit better what I'm talking about. Zoom in here. Now I've got the grid turned on and we also have the sun and the moon turned on. Sun, of course, is in the yellow line and the moon track is in the white line. And the Terminator line between sunrise and sunset, in this case, this is sunset right here, go around and well, over or whatever. And here's our sunrise point heading out across over to the west. So everything to the right of the yellow line is light and everything to the left is darkness. Okay, anyway, getting back to that, the reason we're keeping track of that is because the sun and the arrival of the X-Class Flare, we want to see what side of the Earth the Sun is on at any given time. And anyway, back to it. Right at the tip of the arrow, 6.2 earthquake came in at 5.9 originally and brought up to 6.2. Now, it is directly on the tip of the arrow right at the X, and that's not the only activity to talk about. We'll get into Europe and Greece, the United States, and the spread of earthquakes going all the way up to Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. But this one first, let's go look at the USGS plate boundary map. So here's the 6.2 out on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. We are east of South America, obviously. And this 6.2 right at the X, the reason we have an X there on the map, you can trace it back over to the west to the north part of South America. And the amount of activity a few days ago, which I can show you from a few days ago right here marked in red, you see it, right? A bunch of fours, a 5.8 up to near six, and eruptive activity at San J. Reventador and Nevado del Ruiz Volcano. That all added up to six, 6.0 worth of energy, and it flowed up and around the bend of the plate. We got a new outbreak over in East Caribbean, going up to mid-range four, and then the flow, all cumulative total, back out over to the east right at the X. X marks the spot, tip of the arrow, 6.2. Last time this happened, we had a 7, well, 6.9, and we went back through the planet and came out on the opposite side, or around the planet, on the ring, or the disk. Whether it's round or a disk, I don't know, but we came back out on the other side with significant sized activity that was worth mentioning that was the largest of the year, 7.6 followed by another 7.6 over to the east. And if you hear sound behind me, guys, that's the Duchess. She says she's in here doing some craft work and other things for the Dutch sense operation. Say hi, babe. Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, no, it's all good. It's, you're all good. You're all good. We're live. I'm recording. This is how it goes. All right. Okay. All right. Love you, babe. Okay. Anyway, yeah. So let's just recap. So 6.2 here, Mid-Atlantic Ridge, tip of the arrow, flow around South America opposite side of the planet, we watch for antipode earthquake activity. So antipode meaning opposite side of. So there we go. Now, look at this. A spread of the same sized earthquakes going 10,000 miles from the middle of the Indian Ocean, 4.7, back over to a 4.7 to 4.8, right on the path of the sun and the moon, then going back down and around, back to our largest of the bunch, 5.4, and then back up across Taiwan, up across Japan, up across Alaska, going right up to the tip of Canada, and then picking back up on the coast of the United States with no earthquakes reported on the coast of Canada of any significant size. Now to see this stepping stone path of the same sized earthquakes, you almost have to look at it like from a planet away. The spacing on these. Now the spacing is something like very low frequency where imagine this is a wave where the peak of each top of each wave comes up hundreds if not thousands of miles apart and this would be a wave spreading out across this big thick red line. 
Look at the USGS map, it even shows it. Even the USGS map shows it going from here to here to here to here to here. Do you see the spacing? How it's somewhat equidistantly spaced across this uneven plate boundary. If this was perfectly rectangular or perfectly square, or even a round tank that was perfect, I think the dis distribution would be perfect. But because of the uneven spacing of the shapes of the plate boundaries, the cracks in the plates, this wave is coming up, the peaks are coming up as near to equidistant as possible. And that's what's going on, spreading out from here in a direction to the north, and from here in a direction over to the west. Let's compare. From here at Papua New Guinea, direction to the north, and here, Papua New Guinea, direction over to the west, Indonesia out to the mid-Indian Ocean. That's what's going on. Indisputable. Meanwhile, all of Asia quiet, going from Iran in the Mideast back up into China, up into Siberia, Russia. Not a single large earthquake reported at all. Not even a moderate earthquake, not even a four, with all this going on on one side. And over across, all this going on the other, over in Europe. Check Greece off the list right here, 5.2 struck. It has been many months since mainland Greece has gotten hit with anything significant at all. And this is the exact spot we talked about in the last update, where all three sets of rings overlapped on perfectly at the Io Nina range. Now I had somebody from New Zealand show up below my most recent video, I think, denying that this means anything, saying that it's an earthquake prone zone. And well, if you issue a forecast in an area that normally has earthquakes, that's nothing. Well, I'm gonna have to deny that. That's not accurate. It's been many months since Greece mainland has been hit. We got hit down in the ocean down here in the Mediterranean, but on land, getting it down to within 50 miles of my warned area. I don't know. Look, you can deny it all you want, but what's up with the people from New Zealand doing that? It's, it's deliberately like people in New Zealand. It's really weird. Uh, okay. So 5.2 instead of a 6.2, we were looking for something in the six range. Instead, a mid range five comes in. That's within the magnitude, but it's a little less than I'd expect. Let's get a sip of my coffee while we wait. Think about that for a second. So, oh, hold on one second. We almost just choked on the coffee. A little bit came out the, uh, out the nose. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, what, a, what a great live update. Man, I'm leaving everything in here. I'm not going to splice one thing out. You're getting the full uncut update. I'm going to upload this to YouTube after we're done here. So let's recap. Five point something striking in Greece, right in the middle of all three sets of our previous earthquakes. There was no earthquake activity across all of Europe except for those three sets of threes. Well, no noteworthy earthquake activity when I did the forecast. So now check that off the list. Let's go over and look at the plate boundary on the USGS map, show you where it broke. So here's Greece, here's Italy, and we had warned right here where the, whoops, where the two plate boundaries come together at Greece in Italy. That's called the Ionina range. And it broke right here. Let's go back and compare. Here's where the five point something quake struck, right. If this was a witch's face with a pointy nose and a long chin, we're on the south part of her hairy chin. <laughs> if this is the witch's face, we're on the south part of the chin. So we're quite literally right where they meet. And uh, so, where did it come from? Well, the 5.2 in energy came from a flow coming out of Asia several days back, which I think we can still see on the screen here now. There it is. So out of Western Iran or Eastern Turkey, a 5.6, a flow of energy worth 5.6 coming in over here on the plate boundary a few days back, which prompted me to issue the warning here to strike. And it, of course, hit last night. 5.6 over here, 5.2 in Greece. Not much of a loss going across that huge distance. Let's see, that's 200 miles. Two, four, six, eight, a thousand miles, maybe 1,200 miles distance in a couple days time. And we just go from a 5.6 down to a 5.2. That's not even a half magnitude's loss of energy going through there. But what's really going on is a wave is bouncing back and forth in there. And it's eventually going to reach out up into Italy and go around Europe around the outside edge. And when I say eventually, that's what's happening now. Look, 
a 3.2 to 3.4, striking right on the bend of the plate at Romania. And we go up around Romania, and we go up into Poland, and we have a 3.1 to 3.2. But I'm really interested in the 3.2 that struck here on the coast of Holland this morning. Now, where is it, right? Like, well, it's over 50 earthquakes old, and the USGS ignored it. USGS has reported ones and twos down in Egypt before, but they're ignoring the three up at Holland. I wouldn't be surprised if you guys have some kind of natural gas pipeline eruption or explosion or something like that. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but you know the pipeline comes in right through there in North Holland, right? Comes out of Germany where it got blown up over in the Baltic Sea over to the east. But come on, new three? And what's up? Are they going to come out and try and deny this one like they did two weeks ago when the 2.8 hit? You got to understand. Listen to this, guys. Listen, listen to me, guys. Listen to me. About a week and a half ago, you can find my video over on YouTube where I warned Holland for a four to strike out in the ocean out here, right off the coast of Holland or just east of the UK, right at the tip of the arrow. And instead of a four, a 2.8 plus several other twos were reported here, right off the coast of Holland, and the or right on to land at the coast of Holland. And the Holland mainstream media, the Netherlands, the European media, was waiting with stories about how it's related to the gas pumping operation there. And it's not anything to worry about. And it means nothing. And it's just a gas pumping earthquake, they said. Well, a couple hours later, after they dismissed that 2.8 out right on the coast, a series of other twos broke out in North Germany at the East Eiffel volcanic field south of the Holland border, which they couldn't dismiss or call gas pumping earthquakes. Then the next day, literally the next day, the pipeline that comes in here goes into North Germany, out of Baltic, boom, over here, and they called it from the Russians, or the U.S., or whoever did it, Chinese, who knows, somebody, right? They tried to blame it on somebody. Meanwhile, the seismic that happened before that, everybody just ignored. Seriously, I'm the only one who noticed it, or even said anything about it. And the Holland media dismissed the first earthquake as just a gas-pumping earthquake, right? Well, now here we are, and a three-point-something freaking earthquake hits, right on the coast of Holland, right on the arrow. And now it's gone. USGS ignores it. So do you want to see it? Let me go over to the European feed. European feed. List of latest earthquakes. And I guess I'm just going to have to scroll down till we see Holland here. Or Netherlands or whatever. Um, just going to have to read each name until we get to the quake. Since the USGS is pulling some funny business. Then I'll just keep scrolling down until I see it. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. But if you have to do this to go find a quake in a rare location that doesn't hardly ever get hit where you issue a forecast for, you'd think people would be happy, right? So, uh, again, I'm getting pretty down the far down the list. for. But you see how easy it is for 50 earthquakes to happen in a day's time and to knock stuff off the list. So if their list is only 50 earthquakes long... Man, you're not even going to get a full day's worth. Not even a full hour's worth in some times. And it's a way to keep everybody thinking that everything's low when it's not. That's another reason I think that we're going through this. Man, I'm, I might have scrolled past it already because we're getting into yesterday. And I still don't see it, but I know it was there. So let's go back to page five. Man, this is really annoying, isn't it? Imagine having to do this for every quake. This is why it matters if they get reported and put onto a map, because otherwise you're going to be just burying it in information that's almost impossible to find. And I'm sure there's some way to search it on their site, like search by a region or something, but I'm not going to even... I mean, come on, man. It's a rare earthquake in, in Holland or Netherlands. Well, we're still on the 8th. I mean... This is ridiculous, honestly. I, I just wanted to prove it to you. That's all I'm trying to do. I know we're online. I know there's going to be people who don't believe this, that, and the other. Dude. I must have scrolled past it. I don't get it. Or did they delete it? <laughs> anyway, it was on the feed. God dang it. God dang it. It was on the feed, I promise you. All right, I'll go back one more. Presuming that maybe it was international time on the 7th or something. 
There's Switzerland. Okay, they got Switzerland. Uh, Bosnia. And... All right. Screw it, man. Damn, all that for nothing. And again, I probably scrolled past it or something. You guys are probably all sitting there yelling at the screen. Dutch, it's right there. Whatever. So why am I taking the time to try and prove that to you? Because it, it's proof that A, you're not getting the full picture. And B, we got the same sized earthquakes going across all of Europe in a day. Going from here at Romania, back up into Poland, back across to Holland, down here at Italy, and so forth. Now, going to the west by southwest, we go to the Canary Islands. Check this out. Spain started to move with small earthquakes down in South Spain, as well as a new five. Well, I shouldn't say a new five. The original earthquake was upgraded to a five, 4.9. And that matters because that's almost like a repeat of what happened last year or this past year with a five that broke out in South Spain and another five that hit in Morocco on the south side here of Gibraltar. Then, shortly after that, the flow was directed down to the Canary Islands and new eruptive activity started to take place. Looks like that's getting ready to take place again. The flow going down to the Canary Islands, I mean. So here we are. It's gone somewhat quiet out at the Azores, out at the X. Meanwhile, Canaries is starting to flare up. And there's our new push coming in. It's about a magnitude less than expected. Again, if I'm looking for a 6 and a 5 point something comes rolling in, okay, that's good news, I guess. But over to the west, let's go show you what's over to the west here. Here's Gibraltar, and here's over to the west, out towards the Canary Islands and out towards the Azores. So that speaks for itself. A new push coming in, following the red lines over to the west. Again, break in Greece. Going to go up into Italy, back down across Spain. Boom, go out to the Azores normally. But with the break in Gibraltar, it's directed in that direction. You see which way the plate boundary points. So when it breaks, looks like it directs the flow down there a lot. It's probably been that way for thousands of years. Okay, recapping. New deep earthquakes on their way and taking place. USGS ignoring a lot of them. To get them, you have to pay attention to the European feed, which is 50 earthquakes long. You'll see the earthquakes raised high off the globe here, but we're being kept in the dark on deep earthquakes in a lot of locations. Now, spread, pretty obvious, going down to New Zealand, 4.3. Down in South New Zealand, nothing in between the two. Look at the halfway point in New Zealand between the two earthquakes on either side of New Zealand. Where does that put us? It puts us topo south to Wellington or really to the Cook Strait. So Cook Strait to Topo. What's gonna break there? Near five. We got a 4.9 on one side and a 4.3 on the other. If we add them together, it equals 4.943. So would we round it up to a five or would we just call it a, another 4.9? Point Nemo moving with the 5.7. Look at the fracture zone. Goes right down to the letter X, but look, we can trace it back. Goes back to an under seamount chain which then goes up and connects into north of New Zealand in the Kermadec Islands, going to Tonga, 5.7. Out across over into South America we go, 4.4, 3.9, 4.4, 4.2, just like what we were talking about yesterday and the day before. Same-sized earthquakes minus large activity. Large activity has flowed up around and over to the east. That means it's going to be coming into the south and flowed down around and south over to the east by southeast. Last week, it already happened once. Take all these earthquakes, add them together, 5.5, 5.3, 5.1, 5.3, 5.1, 5.1. It adds up to a 5.9, but new earthquakes going to be coming in down there. Bigger, since we're dealing with bigger here. Okay, so all the X's are going to go. Iceland, let's go ahead and just warn Iceland. New six incoming to Iceland. Look, if we got fives down in Greece and the cumulative totals coming out your way. Look, you had your volcanic activity a couple of weeks back. Now, looks like seismic's on its way. Don't mistake the seismic for volcanic. So you're going to see a new earthquake in the 6.0 range up in Iceland very soon, and you might think that that means a new blast is coming, but I think that's just the arrival of the wave. The wave is coming up and across Japan and heading over towards the United States. It's unmistakable. And the spacing on this says something like extremely low frequency, ELF. Not ULF, we're not thousands and thousands of miles apart. And we're not VLF, which is hundreds to a thousand or so miles apart, right? So you have VLF, you have ELF, you have ULF. Anyway, I think we're in the ELF range on the distance here. 
the distance and the spacing and the magnitudes. Again, think of this like a wave, and these are all about the same size wave peaks going across this red line coming out of the West Pacific, going up past Japan over to the United States. How much energy do you think it would take to displace everything from here and in Indonesia west to the Indian Ocean and north and east all the way to the United States? Um, the correct scientific terminology, cover up your children's ears. I'll give you a second to cover up your kids' ears or turn on the microphone. The correct scientific terminology for that is a shit ton. A lot. A huge amount of energy displaced one quarter of the known planet going from the United States all the way back over towards the Indian Ocean. On the same level, on a 4.0 basis, in at less than a day, these are all white-colored earthquakes for the most part. They all happen today. The pink-colored earthquakes happened last night. So the Aleutians last night first started to go, then boom, break all the way across, tracing it back to here, which really traces it back to the middle of all the deep earthquakes that you only see half of the deep earthquakes on because omission and scientific ignorance. Literally ignorance, like ignoring. Okay, United States. How about a load of threes, twos, and ones going across the whole North American craton? Craton. 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 You like that? On the North American craton. So really, just compare the edge of the North American craton with the threes, twos, and ones. And you see, we go through Texas, back down through the South United States, back up the East Coast, and we go up right to... Well, at this case, we're at the Vermont-New Hampshire border with Quebec on the northeast. And it's all about the same size quakes all the way across the plate. Once we get to the New Madrid seismic zone, where the 1.7 I've just highlighted is, we take a step down slightly, but not that much. I mean, literally within a magnitude. And we're back up the east coast. So it's maintaining momentum, this wave that's coming in from the west coast. Let me show you U.S. west coast here. This is the plate boundary here, the red line that separates the Pacific from the United States or Pacific from Laurentia, the continent here. So wave comes in from the north, bends into edge of Kraton. Kraton comes from Greek word Kratos, which means strong. You guys ever seen my big fat Greek wedding? <laughs> it comes from the word. Okay. All right. Okay. Oranges and apples. Okay, there we go. Tula, why you no like me? Coming in on the edge of the Craton from the north. Let's recap. Line of the same sized earthquakes coming out from the northwest, out off the coast, which is the Juan de Fuca fracture zone. Then we take a step down into twos. We go and spread across the entire rest of the plate. And it's following the Craton edge like a wave guide. Proving that there's a flow, proving there's a trajectory, proving there's something causing the earthquake. Some, some other force is spreading through this plate first. Then the earthquake break after the wave rises or it passes through. I don't know whether it's the, it, the earthquakes are happening at the highest point of the wave peak or at the lowest part of the trough at the bottom of the wave. All I know is that it's equid equidistantly spaced across following this like it's following a river. And this is my biggest discovery, that there's a trajectory or flow to the seismic and that they're all about the same size, going across huge distances, proving that there's something spreading across the distances that's causing the earthquakes. It's the force that causes the earthquakes is what I think we found. So anyway, threes going down through California, threes going over to Texas, threes going over to Oklahoma, twos going up the East Coast. And now what I wanna do is look at the earthquakes over the last seven days and find the new spots which should be hit. So this one, for instance, is pretty obvious. There's three earthquakes in the Northeast in the last 24 hours, or oh, I'm sorry, 48 hours. And look where all three sets of rings overlap. Do you see that? It's almost like the Olympic symbol or something, or anyway, some kind of Egyptian symbol. But down in the middle where all three sets of rings overlap, the flower of life, that's what it is, right? The Egyptian symbol. Anyway, it's a, right there. It's pretty obvious we're right at the border of, what is that, New York and Vermont. So New York and Vermont border, we're going to warn. 
And we're going to warn you for the same size that's down in Texas. So down in Texas, it's going up to 3E. So that means a new 3 is going to be traveling all the way over to the East Coast and going up the East Coast edge and hitting up here in the Northeast. Now, don't fault me, no pun intended, if it comes in in Quebec, for instance, right across the border in Canada, but it's still the same spot. Now, here is another spot where there's three distinct sets of earthquakes, one on the New Mad one set on the New Madrid, one down here at South Tennessee, one in East Tennessee. That's again on the edge of the Craton. So let's look on the edge of the Craton in the middle of all three sets of these earthquakes right here. And that actually puts Kentucky in the mix, huh? Kentuck. Oh, Kentuck. God, going to watch out for an earthquake. <laughs> come on, I'm from Missouri. You could come up here and razz me all day long, whether or not it's Missouri or Missouri or whatever it is. I got the right. I got the right. Now, check it out. We're right here. We're only going to warn for, a, again, a three. So it's going to be a three up in the northeast and a three in the southeast. Now, in between the two, right here, puts us into Virginia. Virginia, D.C., Delaware, New Jersey. And the last several times I issued warnings for this spot, nothing got reported. When I say nothing got reported, I mean that, but something happened. All kinds of people up there, not my viewers, but like average Normie Joes on the mainstream media, started to report shake reports and felt reports. They're feeling all kinds of stuff. They tried to blame it on, first they blamed it on sonic booms, but then people went and checked the flyovers and there was nothing, okay, not even any, any military to be going that fast. And then they tried to say, what the hell did they try to say? Fireworks? I think they ended up coming in with fireworks or something. Anyway. They, they dismissed it, all right? There, something could have hit. I, there's no way for me to know. I mean, when they deny or something, but I know for certain the professionals are watching. Man, they called for my arrest. <laughs> so anyway, is, if it hits there, I don't know if we'll get the report unless it's significant enough to actually cause damage, right? Because like if it's a shake comes in and it's a three, they'll just whoosh, not report it and say it's a sonic boom or something. Anyway, will they hide it all the way up in the Northeast? I don't know. Or in the Southeast? I don't know. There's a lot I don't know. All I know is that, man, there's a lot of hiding of stuff. It's like the fracking earthquakes. Back when all these started in Oklahoma and Texas, people called me a conspiracy theorist and tree hugger and said that I must work for a Greenpeace and an environmental terrorist for saying that earthquakes were happening next to oil, gas wells, and geothermal pumping operations. <laughs> now it's accepted science. So they even try to blame it on wastewater disposal only and really just foolish stuff. Let's go look up these quakes over here in Oklahoma. Go see what's over in Dover, Oklahoma. Again, 10 years ago, I was literally fighting for my life online here. You can go back and find the videos and read the comments down below. Professional after professional coming over using their real names to just freak out on me for saying that these oil pumping operations, all these little square pads, all of these were causing earthquake activity that they drill. And then after they drill, it creates a perforation, and when you do a whole bunch of drilling, it perforates the area. People came over and said, well, if that's the case, why isn't Saudi Arabia having earthquakes? I said, because they don't have a Craytown edge going through the center of their plate, dude. Turns out, when the Craytown edge is a flowing point for Mother Nature to flow across, a seismic river going around the outside edge of the plate. Turns out that's where a lot of the oil and gas is, and we drilled it and perforated it. And so... The flow is going around the outside edge of the plate, and we came in and drilled the hell out of it to top it off. Of course there's going to be outbreaks there. It's like the new New Madrid seismic zone from Texas over to Oklahoma because of all the drill points. Previously, the flow would come over to the east and get stuck up in the New Madrid seismic zone in this sharp N-shaped bend of the plate. And now it gets caught up back behind it at the drill points back in Texas and Oklahoma as the flow is going across. So I call Texas and Oklahoma, Kansas, the new New Madrid. And the old New Madrid seismic zone is the old catch point. Now, some people even ask me, do you think they knew this? And maybe that's why they drilled Texas and Oklahoma with out in the middle of nowhere where they could get a big quake and it really wouldn't matter. Whereas if a big earthquake hits on the New Madrid, it could affect everywhere from Chicago and St. Louis all the way south to the coast and all the way east to the east coast. So that's a big deal. Right, the flow going across the plate and the drill points affecting the flow or at least interfering with it. Now, let's also talk about what happened over on the west coast of the United States because Ridgecrest got hit 
as well as Southern California next to San Diego, right at the southern border of California with Mexico, just west of Sultan Sea. Now, this is at the Ocotillo, Ocotillo, Julian, California location, and I can just turn on our plate boundary map and tectonic plates. Oh, hold on. Tectonic plates and U.S. faults. There we go. So here's the San Andreas. Goes down to the south, goes over across the border. At the Imperial Fault, it becomes, uh, well, at the Imperial California, it becomes the Imperial Fault. Now, the smaller faults, this is the San Jacinto, and this is the Elsinore. Now, the San Jacinto and Elsinore transfer energy from the San Andreas straight down to the Imperial, bypassing Salton Sea for the most part. Now, professionals found about six, seven years ago, University of Southern California announced that this whole area here was in a slow slip, an episodic tremor slip, an ETS, where tremors and small shaking happens, vibrations, as the plate shifts, and the greater plate is this, the red lines around the Pacific plate, where they meet up with North America Laurentia, and that this was slow slipping and would eventually lead to an extremely large earthquake down here. This is University of Southern California study, not my take on it. They didn't put a time frame on it other than it will eventually break and cause massive damage here in this southern area where the plate is slow slipping in an episodic tremor slip. Now, those are two different things that they said at two different times. The episodic tremor slip in the studies there, they say that it will lead to a large earthquake. There is other studies and other reports from professionals up in the Northwest where they're in denial and say that episodic tremor slips don't lead to large earthquakes. And every time one happens, a large earthquake during the episodic tremor slip, they call it chance. Every time. Anyway, so the people up here in the Northwest are in denial about episodic tremor slips having an earthquake effect. Meanwhile, University of Southern California study from six or seven years ago says episodic tremor slips down here can lead to a large earthquake. <laughs> Left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. They're both doing something over in the corner, though, if you know what I mean. So, now, going down across... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that, that, that was uncalled for. <laughs> Sorry! Whoops! Okay, teacher, teacher's on a roll this week. You can tell I got shut down. You can tell I hit the power to my house and I'm a little fired up. Now let's go down and look at the whole line of earthquakes going across the coast. Even a person who's never looked at this before. If I turn off the numbers here, so numbers confuse people, right? But you can understand dots on a page that that's where the earthquakes are striking. So in two days' time, take a look at it. There's a line of earthquakes coming down the coast, coming out of this lightning bolt shape up here. The lightning bolt shape's the Juan de Fuca fracture zone. Back over on the USGS map up over here, it looks like a letter M. Anyway, coming out of there and going down the coast, look at it. It's the San Andreas. I mean, come on, it's the most famous earthquake zone on the planet. Everybody understands that. But look, branching in Northern California off as if it's branching around the valley. Earthquakes going down the other side of California. Now wait, as if... It's branching off. Did you hear what I just said? What's branching off? Well, the earthquakes, of course, Dutch. Well, of course they are. Look at them. They're going down the coast. And they're going over along the California border. They're both going in the same direction. But that means there's something that's breaking around California first and it's causing the earthquakes. Do you know what I mean? There's a flow of something first that's breaking around California and then the earthquakes are going around. It's not just that the earthquakes are going around California. There's some kind of force traveling around California. It's causing the freaking earthquakes, obviously. The professionals miss this. So there's a flow coming in from the northwest. Let's go back to the USGS map. Flow coming in from out here. Gee, I wonder where it's coming from. You see the broken edges of the Pacific plate here? It's like sawtooth edges. They're pushing into North America, the North American Craton. Well, it turns out this wave that's dropping off all the fours and fives and sixes and sevens and so forth around the plate, when it gets in here, gets caught up in here and transfers into the plate and then flows around it. And that's how we get threes going all the way across the plate in a day or two days going down to the weak points. The weak points are drill points as well as volcanoes. Drill points, volcanoes, and a few folds in the plate. That's it. So perforations in the plate, whether from Mother Nature, volcanic, or geothermal, and or from people drilling for oil, gas, or geothermal. They're perforations and weak points. The magma chambers, of course, speak for themselves. Yellowstone Magma Chamber in Idaho and Yellowstone National Park. 
right along the edge of the Craton in northwest Wyoming, going up into Montana. And that Craton, man, I keep referring to it. It's, it is. It's one of my biggest discoveries. Look at the flow that comes out of, let's say, northwest United States in the course of a couple days. And damn, again, there's so many numbers on the screen there. Coming out of the northwest, and it's like a big arrow in its own right. Here, hold on. Let me back this out. It's literally occupying the edge of the Craton all the way over. The purple part, the deformed edge of the Craton. And then it goes up to the more stable portion, the rusty brownish color, and goes around it. Do you realize how big of a deal that is? Do you understand how big of a deal that is and how the professionals are shitting themselves and cannot stand that a guy like me, high school grad, found that? When they all said it couldn't happen and doesn't happen, whatever. They don't provide any proof on that. Anyway, the flow is going around the United States. And guess what? It's not just the United States. It's Europe, too. It's going around the outside edge of Europe from the other direction. Going around the S-shaped bend in the plate. Let's go over to Europe and take a look. So I just showed you. Again, this is the biggest discovery, man. That there's a flow going around a plate. That means you can calculate and, well, like a train almost. A trajectory. So coming out of the northwest, we follow the interior edge of the craton. We get down to Yellowstone right here, edge of the craton. I'm going to leave the craton diagram on. We're going to go down across through Texas, make a bend back up into Arkansas, and then go up into the New Madrid seismic zone. Here's St. Louis, Missouri. We branch off up to the north in the Wabash Valley seismic zone, which dead ends into Ohio. And then you make a U-shaped bend down through the south and back up the east coast. That's the North American craton. And the earthquakes go across that, following it like a wave guide. I've said that a thousand million times. And we'll go over to Europe. And going around the outside edge of Europe, but almost in the exact opposite way. Remember, the United States makes an S-shaped bend in a U down through the south in the U.S. And we get over here to Europe, and it's making an S-shaped bend in a U-shape, but it's sideways. Same thing, though. And it goes around... And then this is Romania. This is Poland. Up here is Holland. I'm going to turn on my volcanoes. Check this out. The volcanoes are at all the bends in the plate here. So at the first S-shaped bend, you've got the Lucaret Basalts and the Apsunini Mountains. These are from Ice Age. Then you go around this edge of the bend, and you have South Hagarita and Perzani Mountains. Again, these are all volcanoes marked by the Smithsonian. Then we come up around through Poland. And we make our first bend in the plate up here. And at the south bend, two. At the next bend, Bruntal Volcanic Field. You go around the next bend, and you have the Sheb Basin. And you go around the next bend, and you have West and East Eiffel Volcanic Field. Then you go around the next bend, and you get to the Chan de Puis, the Chain de Puis. Pois. And we keep on going all the way down, following it back down to South Spain where I've already taken you on this nice little journey around Europe a thousand million times before if you're of your mind. So what's really going on? The flow is following the plate boundaries, then the plates absorb off the plate boundaries, and the flow goes around the craton edges and tries to escape out around to a path of least resistance out and away from the tension where it's coming from. In other words, you push on something and the pressure goes around it and comes back around the outside edge on the outside. It's common physics applied on a massive scale. Okay, so now let's just recap on the planet. We're watching on the solar. I have not checked the solar today, but I know the storm arrived last night going into this morning. And now that the storm has arrived, we have two to three days at the most. And within two to three days, we start to see a dramatic increase in the number of deep earthquakes, which I think the professionals are trying to hide from you. Either that or they're just deliberately not reporting them. Which is hiding it, isn't it? Like, if they're just deliberately not reporting it, but there's no real reason why, like, they just, they're lazy or something. It's still hiding it from you. So, we'll wait and see if they report the deeps. I don't know if they will. We will see the shallower largers between the deeps. Especially with something like this. When we see something going right at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the last time this happened, opposite side of the planet, antipode quakes within a couple days. Huge. I hope I'm wrong. We'll know within a couple days. Somebody said I was trying to milk this for the money for the month. I said, dude, this is going to only be a couple days. What are you talking about? And I've already made so much you wouldn't even believe it. Dude, I could just like turn off ads at this point for now. 
People didn't believe it. I'm like, no, no, for real. They thought I was exaggerating. I just showed everybody over on YouTube. I'm like, you're not gonna believe him. I'm like, getting shut off over here on Twitch, actually. Like, I mean, like 10 times more. Sir, I'm not kidding. 10 times more doing videos over on YouTube than here on Twitch. 100 to 200 people here on Twitch watching me live whenever. And then upload it over to YouTube. 6,000, 8,000, 10,000 people in a live premiere over on YouTube. It's insane, the amount of censorship, I mean. So the difference is insane. But I'm keeping the live stream going so that people can watch the earthquakes live. Obviously, you're not getting the full picture from the USGS. And the Europeans is limited because of their short feed. So between the two, you've got to have the Europeans on, the USGS on, and maybe even a few others. And that'll give you a better idea of what's really moving around the planet real time. And when you see it, you see that there's real time movement between areas. And they said that doesn't happen. And man, they'll shut you off for talking about it because they, they'd have to rewrite. You know how many textbooks have to be rewritten because of this? You know how many egghead professionals look like complete jackasses for saying it was impossible without providing proof? The USGS website. Nobody's demonstrated the ability to be able to predict earthquakes. They're using the word predict like literally instead of forecast, they use the word predict. I'm like predictions for the horse races and maybe for a lottery or something, but forecasting is what we do for natural processes. <laughs> your title predictions. Oh, your title predictions were off by an inch. You're wrong. It's like, no, the tide still came in, and that's how we do forecasting. Anyway, they said it's not possible, and they have it in writing on their website saying no one's ever demonstrated the ability to be able to do it. Well, I sent them the method. They said they didn't want to test it. Remember? Iris and the USGS said they didn't want to test the method. They gave a reason, too. They said they already know that aftershocks happen. It was the weirdest reply I've ever gotten in my life. I thought they were trolling. But it was a real reply from Iris and the USGS. I sent them the method. You know why I sent them the method, right? I warned California for the largest earthquake in 20 years for the whole state. And I warned the Bay Area here, where the inlet is, down into the Central Valley right here. I tried to get it for a 200-mile stretch from the Bay Area down to the Central Valley. And I warned for 7.0 plus, which I hardly ever do anywhere on the planet, let alone in California on land. Again, it would have been the largest earthquake in 20 years if it hit. So the next day, or was it 36 hours? A day and a half? Maybe two days. Anyway, within two days, the biggest earthquake in California's 20 year history, the last 20 years hit, and it was a 7.5, I think? 7 point something. And it hit right down here at the southeast tip of the valley out at Ridgecrest. So let me show you on the USGS map. I warned here from Bay Area down into, let's say, Fresno. Tried to get a 200-mile stretch. Here's 50 miles. 51, 52. I mean, it was like right on the edge. And instead, it hit right here. So when that happened, again, I issued the warning. Two days later, the biggest earthquake in California's past 20 years hits within, let's just say, within 200 miles, 250 of where I warned. I then sent the method to the USGS and IRIS directly on Twitter publicly. And I said, here guys, I go, I just got the biggest earthquake in California in the last 20 years. And we warned you two days ago for this magnitude and here it is. And IRIS first responded on Twitter and said, we do not want to test, we do, we will not test this. We know that aftershocks are going to happen. And everybody responded like, what? What is aftershocks? What are you talking about? Like, it wasn't an aftershock. There was no earthquake there before. The seven-point earthquake that hit here hit two days after I warned for it, and there was no big earthquake there before. There's not an aftershock. Then the USGS issued a public statement about me on Twitter. I had to call their 1-800 number and threaten legal to get it removed. But the USGS said this, and I'm paraphrasing here, but they said this on Twitter. It's still publicly available if you want to go search it on Wayback Machine or something. And they said, Dutch Sense is not able to accurately predict earthquakes. Now, they use prediction again, right? And any claims made by the account are false. Okay, that's basically what they said. 
we, we were outraged. It's the first science agency in the history of the world. Well, not in the history of the world. In the history of the modern era, I'm the first citizen to ever be gone after by any science agency by name. They might take jabs at topics, you know, this and that or whatever, you know, this is not possible or that is not possible. They don't use their names. They don't come after them verbally by name. I'm the first person to have that happen to. Then I took screenshots of what the USGS said about me on Twitter and I printed them into t-shirts and stickers as a kind of like a bad honor, right? Here they are dissing me publicly, Dutch sense not qualified, Dutch sense if any claims are false. Took screenshots of their Twitter feed, what they said about me, and made it into a t-shirt. The USGS just actually then took that. They didn't just do it. They took that and filed legal claims, legal with jail time claims, against me saying I stole their logo and was using it improperly a violation of U.S. code such and such, and it was filed by their lead media director, their social media director for the whole country. The USGS social media director for the whole country filed it. I didn't get legal notice until after it was rejected by the court system. So this all got adjudicated but without me even knowing. I had to find out about it after Google, not YouTube, Google Legal. Google Legal sent me an email saying that my channel and video have been freed up after legal review because of the USGS filing there. And then I got to see what they filed. And the social media director guy typed it out. He hand typed this and he even put a misspelling in it. That's how I know he hand typed it. And he said it was a violation of, he, he, he didn't say it was alleged or anything. He falsely stated in writing on behalf of the U S government that I stole their logo and was using it improperly. He failed to mention that they were talking about me in what they said. And that's a big difference. It turns out when a government agency talks about you, if they do, and they let's say they put it in a letterhead. Let's say the USGS typed a letter. Instead of issuing a tweet, they typed a letter about me. And I got a hold of it, and there it is. It's referencing me, and it's got their logo at the top. I can take and scan the whole thing and put it into a book and sell it. I can make T-shirts out of it. I can do anything I want with it. They're talk, a government agency is talking about me publicly on the record using my name. And so when they filed that false claim and tried to get me put in jail for 20 years for it and got then rejected by the legal system, I wasn't notified until after it was rejected. Isn't that insane? So here we are. What's the problem? Well, earthquakes can be forecast. The reason they can be forecast is because there's a trajectory and there's a wave that's traveling out causing the earthquakes. And that's good to know that there's something that's causing the earthquakes. And that if you can detect that, which I think you can, and I've made a post on my community page, membership on an invention that I think would work on how to measure and detect this wave before it causes the earthquakes. I think it's already been done. A guy already did it back in the late 90s and documented the whole thing. He didn't know what he was detecting at the time. But electro electric signals in the ground. He had a VLF antenna that he set up between two trees and had the VLF antenna sitting on the ground. And he started picking up electric signals, but he couldn't figure out what they were. They were in intermittent but regular patterns. He didn't know where they were coming from. And he called it just, I, I forget exactly what he called it, but he called it just, you know, interferent ground currents or something. He didn't know what he was looking at. But looking at it, it's a wave coming in over the course of hours. And he said it would repeat for hours on end and then go quiet and then repeat for hours on end and go quiet. And I'm like, man, that sounds like a wave sloshing around in a tank. He was picking it up. But we would need to install VLF antennas in the ground. Not big, long, mile-long ones. Just listening antennas a few feet wide. And I think we'd pick it up. Anyway, this has all been denied by the professionals. And we wouldn't be talking about any of this if I would have listened to them and just ran away. Ah, oh, man, I got to tell this story. People are like, why do you rant? I'm like, dude, wouldn't you? My power got shut off to my house and my stream location at the same time at 10 p.m. again. Just two nights ago when I was on live. That's why I'm on ranting. The amount of shutdown that I get for showing that the world of geophysics isn't what they said it is, is insane. But I'm going to keep doing it because guess what? I think all my viewers expect me to do the right and honorable thing, which is to show you what I find and screw the consequences. <laughs> isn't that the honorable thing to do? <laughs> maybe, maybe it's the right thing to do. It might not be, no, Dutch, it's not honorable. The Royal Society of Shithead says that you have to do things underhandedly. And then you can become a druid like us. 
All right. Have a good afternoon, morning, evening, or night. I'll be back. We're going to upload this to YouTube. The time now is 6.17 p.m. Central Time. My clock on my globe there is about three minutes behind live. I don't know what's going on there. 6.17. We're out of here. Peace out. Oh, wait. No, I'm not. Hold on. We got to wrap this baby up right. Do you have an earthquake plan? Do you know what to do when an earthquake strikes? I've never been in an earthquake myself, knock on wood, not even a small one. But I would imagine that if it's a big earthquake, it's going to be just a few seconds and you got to know what to do. And you need a table or a desk to get under. Running around could be hard. You could hurt yourself if you're running around trying to get out of a structure when you could have just, you know, put up with a few falling things around you underneath a table or a desk. Now, if it's a huge earthquake or if you're in a structure that you may feel might not withstand a noteworthy size quake like you know a, a cinder block stack building or a brick building for instance that if you're in one of those you might need to have an exit plan of some kind which is a pain in the ass you have to know where to go you have to know what's outside and all surroundings and you may not be coming back in for a long time so you need to have an emergency kit and grabbing an emergency kit and running out at the same time good luck i don't think it's possible you might be able to do it but you'd have to have the emergency kit literally laying by whatever door you're going to run out Anyway, in the emergency kit, do you have the appropriate things to get you through for a few days? And I'm talking about change of clothes, set of shoes, food and water, flashlight batteries, basic supplies needed, guys. And in this day and age with the way things are going, I don't need to tell you, things are going south pretty quick. And I mean, like, bad. Bad. And I'm not talking mainstream media bad either. I'm talking about the stuff they're not telling you about. Like, all the weird spiritual stuff that's going on that they don't want you to believe in. <laughs> All the stuff you don't believe in, turns out it's true, guys. I hate to break it to you. The science guy, uh, the punk rock science guy has now become in belief in God. Time for you to wake the F up a little bit because, dude, hello, frog pot hot. Jumping out. Yeah. When the guy who listened to dancing exploited and, uh, and misfits and uh, was running around screaming subhumans and crass and... With the Mohawk, when he's here telling you about God, I think it's time for you to wake up. And if you're an atheist, I don't know what to tell you, man. Uh, so was I. So all the weird shit started to happen. <laughs> all right, okay. Too much truth. We're out. <laughs>